The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Listening to Paranormal Concept right here on Parasearch UK Radio with your host Paul Brook. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Paranormal Concept. I'm your host Paul Rook, and tonight, wow, what a doozy of a show we've got for you tonight. I like that word, doozy. I think that's my word <laughs> of the week. Um, I'm going to introduce, first of all, Kerry Greenaway, my co-host for tonight. Hello, Kerry. Good evening. How are you? I'm good. Fan Debbie Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're coming out with all the words tonight. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, it's going to be a really good show. We have tonight with us um, a, uh, how would we describe him? Archaeologist, artist and someone really well known in the paranormal field we've got norman fay everybody so hello norman hi guys hello hi. paul hello kerry hello listeners <laughs> yeah that's it if anyone's got any questions they want to ask just pitch it in the um chat room and we will pass on and we will try and get every question answered so let's start with um norman Tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all, and how you got into the archaeology and the paranormal. Okay. Um, I'm a Derbyshire lad uh, from deepest, darkest Ilkeston, (laughs) which is in between Derby and Nottingham. And uh, my dad used to work for the electricity board, electricity company. And he got um, he got a a chance to go and speak at a conference in 1964 in Bournemouth of all places and he decided to take the family on a holiday and on the way down we visited Stonehenge. Uh, I was 64 so I would be about eight, about eight years old and I've got a very famous photograph of me sitting on the slaughter stone and it knocked me out. I will never forget that first visit to Stonehenge those days you could actually walk inside the stone circle and do whatever you like but it's not like that anymore um so that was my first exposure to if you like prehistoric stuff uh never forgot it and then in 1968 the bbc uh transmitted a nightly show uh and does anybody know what silbury hill is no, no. I, I don't. <laughs> well, K- Kerry, you went to Avebury, so Silbury Hill is that huge, great big mound of earth uh, about a mile away. It's a massive, it's the largest man-made earthwork yeah, in Kerry, Europe. Yeah, you should have known that. I know, I should have, it was a flying visit, I will admit that, it was a flying visit, yeah. but oh my goodness, I what wish I'd bi- spent longer there. What the, what the BBC did, they dug a hole into the side of the hill and they filmed it. And I watched every night. I couldn't wait for it to come on after the news. And it was, that's what all really got me fired up. And in 1969, um, I was a paper boy, right? <laughs> I was, did they do still, did still deliver papers, right? You know, like day to day, door to door. And I had this paper round. And every Sunday, I'd had the biggest paper round. I had two bags of full of, Sunday supplements and everything else. And I sat down in the local park one morning, one Sunday, and there was a, a there was a sequential um, se- sequence of a book come out called Was God an Astronaut? Von, by Eric Von Daniken. Mm, yeah. Right. Very famous. Lost his credibility a bit, but he's coming back. 
And I read that, and that really got my thoughts going. It was really kind of re revisiting what uh, our actual history was all about. And then carry on a little bit up the line, up to 1979, I was living in Birmingham. I've got a job in Birmingham. And a book came out called Mysterious Britain by Jonathan Colin Board. And that switched me on to UFOs, dowsing, stone circles, you name it, your paranormal, ghost hunting, everything. It's in one volume. If you can still get it, try and grab a copy out of um, off Amazon if it's still available. So I'd like to ask you two guys, what do you think is the most famous stone circle in the world? The the only one I I would have said would be Stonehenge. I I don't know of any stone circles anywhere else. Well, I mean I I know there are some, but I just the, the only one I've ever been interested in is Stonehenge. Right. What's the oldest one? <laughs> <laughs> See, for me again, you know, Stonehenge or Avery. You know, they're the two that the most famous that I know of. I'm going to knock your socks off now. Go on then. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to go for the least known one and the oldest one. And it's the place called Nabta Playa, and it's it's in the Nubian Desert, uh, just south of Cairo, uh, in in Egypt. Oh, right. that was going to be my second guess. <laughs> oh, you cheeky monkey! <laughs> now, most people most people have never heard of Nabta Playa at all. They only discovered it in like in the past fifty or hundred years or so. It was buried in sand in the middle of nowhere, and they've discovered it. It goes back ten thousand years. It's ten thousand years. It predates the pyramids. It predates everything. And essentially, what we've got out in the middle of the desert, it has actually become more famous these days. There are some really good. Uh, videos on YouTube if you're interested and go and check those out. I'd look at some of them today. And what what you'd like to do, I'll use a benchmark and we mentioned the pyramids. The pyramids were basically they started to build the pyramids around about 2,500 years BC. Yep. Right. Nab to player predates that by what seven thousand years? Something stupid. Well, they've since discovered that the Sphinx, which is out just outside of the the main, the Great Pyramid, is much older than they ever thought, and it predates everything. It's it's it, it's probably about ten thousand years old, probably more. Cool. Um, what I'd just like to do, just to lay down, um, just for people that are not actually into this stuff. Um, we have a period which Nabta player starts in, and it's called the Mesolithic, which is, forget about all the terminology, you can forget about all the dates, really. It's, all I'm trying to do is try to boil it down into something where you can understand the kind of chronology of it. The Mesolithic is starts around about 10,000 BC-ish, and then we have what we call the Stone Age, Uh it starts around about 7,000 BC and ends about 2,300 BC. And after that, we have the Bronze Age. This is largely to do with our, you know, in Britain. And that starts at 2,300 and ends about 700 BC. So you've, you've actually divided, divided our, if you like, the development of human beings out... Um, over 10,000 years, 10, 12,000 years. It's not hard and fast because you get movements of people and you get crossovers between periods and one to the other and different ideas. So if I, I'm just looking at my, my little map, <clears throat> uh, if we look at Nabta Playa in the middle of the Nubian Desert, 10,000 BC, 
there's suddenly nothing. Even the pyramids are not built. But suddenly, all of a sudden, you get in Britain, Ireland, and in Brittany, the sudden flourishing of stone circle building. You've got the big guys like Avebury and Stonehenge down in Wiltshire. And then you've got a wonderful site in Ireland called Newgrange. Have you heard of, heard of Newgrange? No, I haven't. Um, do, no. Do, you, do you think it would have been the same race of people that made those stone circles? or Very, po- very, very, po- very possibly. But okay. there's absolutely nothing else on the continent. apart. We seem to be the hot spot for all of the development of the... New Grange was built... Um, it's in the it's in the Boyne Valley uh, near Dublin, mm. and it started as a stone circle, and then they built this huge, great, big mound over the top of it mm. with dec- with decorated stones. And they discovered a f- quite a few years ago that on mid midwinter sunrise, yeah. the light shaft comes straight down the middle of the of the structure and lights up the back of the wall, and it it lasts for about ten minutes, and then it's mm. out. Yeah, I've heard of that one. If we go back to uh, Nab to Player, they've discovered absolutely categorically that it's actually lined on the constellation of Orion in you know in the heavens, as is the Great Pyramids. It's all built around the same idea. So Newgrange, Stonehenge, you know, the pyramids, they're all essentially astronomical observatories. Why have they chosen these places? That's a, that's, a, that's a really good question. I'd like to concentrate on Britain, if I may. <clears throat> Otherwise, it gets a little bit complicated. That's fine if you, if you get a, <laughs> if you get a If you get a map of Britain with Ireland, um, I've, I've actually got a schematic in front of me, which I devised. If you imagine a line from the Isle of Wight and then run it northwards up to Middlesbrough, of all places, everything to the east of that line, you get no stone circles. None. I'm talking East Anglia, Kent, you know, home counties, nothing. You go the other side of that line, and it goes absolutely mental. You've got the, the complex of stone circles down in Cornwall, Devon, Wiltshire, then if you go a bit further north, you go into the Wiltshire, you know, the Stonehenges and all the rest of it. And there's one outlying stone circle called Rollwright Stone, which is in Oxfordshire, which I might come back to if you can try and remind me. Look at Wales. Wales is covered in them. Then in my, my patch, really, where I spent an awful lot of time was the Peak District in Derbyshire with my mate Paul Lim. Uh, we spent a long long time researching that you come further up the country into north into uh into yorkshire then into cumbria then you go into the scottish fields into the islands like scarabray uh orkney and if you go across the 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 irish sea you go into ireland you've got loads and loads of stone circles they just seem to be clustered in one particular part of the, the world. Have you got that's, any questions? That's not really interesting. Why, why do you think that they didn't make any stone circles for, like across the country as opposed to just stopping on that line? Right. Good question, Paul. You've got... There's one, there's one factor... That particularly in Norfolk, there is no stone of any worth. Do you remember the they they discovered Sea Henge? Do you remember Sea Henge? Mm-hmm. I got, yeah. got vague recollection of that. Yeah, yeah. The the, the time team actually it, it, they found it in in the you know in in the marshes just outside of North North Norfolk, and it was yeah. a complete complete circle made out of timber, out of tree trunks. 
Yeah, um, I do. I yeah, you saying that? Did, I do actually remember that. Yeah, Time Team. Time Team did a fantastic job on it. And Mick the Dig actually walked off the dig because he was absolutely disgusted the way the way they did it. It is now in Kings Lynn Museum. They right, they okay. up it up. They dug it up. It's actually in Kings Lynn Museum. We can go and see it. The reason I mention that is an awful lot of stone circles started as timber structures. So our ancestors, for whatever reason, decided on one particular part of the countryside that that's where they're going to put it and that's where they're very, you know, that's a venerated part of the world. It starts as a, a timber structure and then as time goes on, they think, well, let's get some of that stone in and they'll drag stones from miles away like they did at Stonehenge. The, mm-hmm. the blue stones were brought from Prickhelly. Yeah. Uh, in in Wales, I mean that's goodness knows how long. That's about hundred miles or something stupid. Why did they take so much trouble to bring that stone to there? Something of importance was in their heads, and they needed to preserve it. Right. Um. We've okay. got. We've got sorry. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, on that point, while we're talking, they needed to preserve whatever it was at that site, so they brought the stone in from that line, would they not have, I mean, the effort that that would have taken, would that not have translated across the whole country? No, it seems to have been um, a tribal thing, if you like. They, but the, the only reason we know this is from the pottery they've left us. Okay. But, okay, you know, it's... it's a diagnostic type of thing. If you can, if you know what type of pottery these people made, you can you can find out where they came from. An awful lot of people don't realise that nearly all of the the cultures that actually came in to Britain came from the Rhone Valley in uh, in Germany. Wave after wave, the the, the guys the guys the first. Guys that made stone tools came from Neanderthal, right? Then mm-hmm. you get then you get the Beaker people, you get the Neolithic people, you get the Beaker people. They all come from the Rhine Valley, from Germany. All they all did, we've been invaded by Germany more times than you wouldn't want to wave, wave a stick out. <laughs> um, so, so anybody that says that they're actually indigenous <laughs> British, new. <laughs> no, no, no. You come from Germany, probably. If you if you had a DNA check and found out where you came from, all the Scandinavian countries are all from the same. You know, they all came from the same place. But mm-hmm. majority of the people in this country come from Germany, going back to like eighty thousand years ago. They they could walk across. There used to be a land bridge from uh, from the continent over to England in the south south of England. They could walk across it. It was physic, physical thing, a bridge. It's we know where it was, but that's the way they, get, they came. They walked here. So, what's attracting them to certain sites? That's the that's what occupied my mind for years and years and years, and that's the reason why I took up dowsing. Um, okay. There is a wonderful book by a guy called uh, well, a Guy Guy Underwood. It's a it's a book called pattern of the past and guy underwood was uh, i think he was a civil engineer he was a real kind of nuts and bolts bloke and he had to he ended up with a, a dowser in his garden and he said can you teach me how to do that and he did and he ended up and he, he investigated stonehenge he did westminster abbey he, d- he did all these really famous places and the book is it's actually quite a rare book these days, but I've got a first edition. And it, it completely transfixed my idea as to what's going on. What Guy Underwood realised, like the, Egypt, the Egyptians did, like all the ancients did, they knew that there was flowing water underneath these monuments. That's why they chose it. Um, how did they discover that? Well, it's either... I've got two thoughts on this. They either instinctively knew it or they looked at the animals. If you watch cattle, they tend to congregate in one corner of a field for whatever reason it is. 
then it's mostly to because you've got streams running underneath the ground, crossover, and it generates a form of electricity or a power source which you can actually t- detect and the dowser, the dowser with his rods, can actually cr- cross, the, cross the field and say, that's where it is, that's where the water is, and they'll dig a hole and there it is. Now people mm-hmm. used to make people used to make the living out of that. Yeah. How, is that is that totally fanciful? Neither. They I still can... use no. They still use dowsing methods in regards to gem finds. You know, when they're looking for gemstones, they still yeah. use dowsing as a very very um, early geological survey, as it were, before they yeah. then bring the big guns in. They still use dowsing in the gem fields. Yes, I know they do. Um, in Australia and places like for the open. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, do you remember Urigella? Yeah. Urigella, the spoon bender? Yeah. yeah. He made his fortune by he developed a method of flying over in a plane and he used to douse from the plane. Right. And they'd go and dig where he said things would go and they'd strike gold or whatever it was he was looking for. Yeah. He's, I know he was discredited quite a lot, but, you know, there we go. Oh, fame and fortune changes um, the talent, doesn't it? Can you, I just you, ask you, in regards yeah, to dowsing? Yeah. Do you, when you're dowsing, whether it be water, whether it be gemstone, whether it be oil, you know, whatever it is you're trying to douse for, do you, is it the focus? So you have to focus your mind on, I want to find blah, blah, and then it will work? Yes. Yes, in fact, so you, that, you have to have that intention. In fact, Kerry, that's you've you've hit it right on the head because it's that focus, that actual concentration as to what exactly am I looking for. You don't want the monkey mind. You don't want oh I'm oh I might find this, might find that. Inexperienced dowsers t- find just about anything. Now I, I the way I did it, I did it in a very practical way, and I got proof of what I've discovered. That's that's the way I worked. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't do it like that. They, they're a little bit kind of just turn up on a day and say, oh, there's something there and never actually prove it. Well, I did. I And I, I got my degree on that one, I'm afraid. Um, I discovered a medieval village uh, by use of the dowsing rod and I got my degree certificate as a result of that. But what the dowsery is also picking up, and it's a question of teasing out um, the stuff you don't want from the stuff you do want. And if I go onto a stone circle, initially what I'm looking for is not earth energies, I'm looking for water, mostly. And I'll plot where the water is. And then the next bit is kind of expand it and try and tease out... I always recommend that anybody t- tries to take this up, do it, do it properly, and don't do it for any more than an hour because you'll end up with the biggest blinding headache uh, going. Uh, I learned that and the hard way. Yeah, the, same here. Do you remember I mentioned the roll right, roll right stones in Oxfordshire? Yeah. Right. Okay. It's a, it's a funny place. It's it's a stone circle and in the middle of in a county that's got nothing else, prehistoric as such, and it's no stone circles, nothing. And it's got this wonderful stone circle and a huge, great big monolith nearby called the Kingstone. Uh, just as an anecdote, there's a guy was driving past the stone circle early in the morning. He was a, a zoologist, and he was interested in bats. And he had a little machine in the back of his car which recorded uh, bat radar, you know, the high pitch kind of hmm. squeaks they make. And he'd forgot to switch it off. So he was driving past the roll right stones and it goes mental. So he, he pulls his car up, goes into the circle, and it, the stones were actually talking to each other. And they were communicating with the, the kingstone. And that generated a whole project called the, the, the Dragon Project, which of which I was part of and, in, you know, got involved in in the early 80s. And it, it produced a fantastic amount of information, which was never published. Is that to do with infrasound? 
it, it's part of that, um, but it's also to do with the fact that the, the stones were somehow dra- dragging energy out of the earth, converting it. Uh, there is there is a there's a legend that you can never count the number of stones in the roll rights. I've tried it loads of times. You lose count. <laughs> but they, they and they, they the, uh, Don Robbins, Doctor Don Robbins, he he did a major scientific study of it, and he he took some fantastic photographs of it. Uh, speaking stones, I think it was called, or talking stones, and he was completely. And blown away by it <clears throat> but there's something about this innate kind of knowledge of what is under the, gr- under the ground and that's why I'm going to put that stone circle there okay. which, so which what, what do you think the purpose of the stone circles were then if they put the stone circles above the water source were they just sort of over elaborate wells or are we talking um using the energy for something in the stone circle or what they are trying to they're trying to harness the the energy from the earth to help the communities to heal heal people or communicate with the ancestors or whatever it is or just as a gathering place you know, so, this is, so it's more like a, a, a church type thing. Very, very much like a church, yeah. It, okay. It's almost exactly the same idea. And now I've I've doused many churches, <clears throat> and if you don't know, you don't know that many churches are actually built on top of pagan sites. Yeah. Uh, almost exclusively, in fact. Um, and if you go with a dow- set of dowsing rods through the average country parish church, you'll find that there is a water line that runs almost exactly straight through the middle of the the church and you know comes out the other side they, they somehow because the Christ, christianity once christianity caught, caught hold in this country they what they did was they planted their ideas on top of the pagan ideas hence the reason why you've got christmas around yule and you've got you know all the other festivals like halloween uh, all saints day is put on halloween it's a pagan thing, and it, it, what they try to do is just basically look, well, famously, uh, when Christianity was actually introduced to this country in the 7th century, uh, the Pope said, do not destroy the shrines, build next to them. I think that was Melitus, I can't remember, it. well, I think it was Melitus. And that's a really clever bit of psychology, because... If you build your church next to a stone circle, you're going to get these guys coming up and say, well, I'm, it's like footing both camps here. I'm going to have a look see what they do. <laughs> in, there is a very famous uh, site down in Wiltshire where there is actually a, a church inside a stone circle in the middle of it, Knowlton, Knowlton Henge. If you go and check that out on YouTube or whatever, uh, images... Uh, it's, a, it's a church right planted right in the middle of the henge, and I, I need to di- I need to distinguish between a, ch- a henge and a stone circle. Stonehenge is the famous one, but it started originally just as a circular uh, bank and a ditch with entrances to it. The unusual thing about it was that the the ditch was on the inside, not the outside, so it's not. Pro- it's not defensive. It's not to keep people out. It's to keep something in. Yeah. So the hen, a henge is technically an earthwork, but eventually you end up with stones being erected within inside the, the the earthwork. So I, I watched a archaeological program. It, it might have even been Time Team, to be fair. Um, they they said that they obviously you've got the stone circles and then you've got the the ditch. But I think it was on the outside. You've got more post holes. Yes. So it's even bigger than what they initially thought. Yeah, yeah. You've got. Um, I mean, the way that Stonehenge evolved was it started as a um, well. Actually, an awful lot of, it, of research has been done over the past four or five years, and they've really uncovered an awful lot about that. But there was 
we have some of the ancient, uh, the early antiquarians like Aubrey, John Aubrey, who, of which the Aubrey holes are actually named after. And all they are is they dug pits and they put the remains of people inside them and covered them over. And this yeah. is predates this predates the stones and everything else. So you've got people like uh, John Aubrey, uh, William Stukeley, uh, William Stukeley from Lincolnshire. He he was the first man to actually map Avebury. He he was the first person to ever do it. Um, we we owe a debt of honour to these people because from the 17th century and the 18th century. Um, but brings me on to the site which really fired me up more than anything else and i spent i spent 10 years studying this place and it's called R below and it's in right in the peak district up in derbyshire right on the top of a hill and they call it the stonehenge of the north and the first time i visited it was in a thick fog and i didn't even know which end i was coming in there are two entrances to it and the place was completely atmospheric, and I thought, "Wow, this is just amazing." And it, it is. It's like a it's like a ring ditch, and a bank, but it's got all these stones kind of scattered inside of it. Most haunted went there once, and they, they made a right cock up of it. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they were screaming blue murder about seeing UFOs on the on the horizon. Do you know what they were? No, go on. <laughs> Car headlights on a on a on a hilltop, which was just the other side of the valley. That that would make sense to me, especially if you know the geography as well. You know, you, that's yeah, sort of what you would assume. But I did I did a major dowsing survey of that place, and I've got the definitive dowsing map of it, of which I will publish eventually. Yeah. And I'd, I'd, I'd studied all the archaeological digs. There was a massive one done in uh, 1926, which I studied endlessly and did, you know, got, got basically immersed myself into it. I even made a model of it. Uh, all the stones are actually fall, fallen over because of the wind and everything else. If you imagine them all standing up, you'd have, because it's an amazing structure. And right yeah. in the middle, uh, or to one side, is a Bronze Age barrier, so it's a Neolithic structure. But then you've got a Bronze Age burial mound stuck like a like a blister on one corner, of which they found evidence of a burial in it. Right in the middle, in very very similar to Avebury, it's got a co- what they call a cove. It's like a box shaped kind of stone structure. They found a they discovered a skeleton in there. That was that had no no legs below below the knees. Okay. I've I've looked into that, and it was an old tradition where if it, somebody like a, a criminal criminal or somebody like that, they used to take him take his legs off at the knees to stop him running about. And so you you're talking probably Iron Age. Yeah. So it's much later, but what you've got is a continuity of people using an old site. Time after time after time, because they venerate it. Yeah, they. It's it, a bit like you know anything that's that's got anything of worth. They do not forget. Absolutely. And on that note, I'm just going to have a quick break, and we'll be back in about 39 seconds, to be exact. Hello, Harry Price. Yeah. Good evening. If there's nothing myself and everybody else enjoy here on the other side more is the sit back and relax and listen to Parasearch Radio with its paranormal news, views and reviews from across the UK and beyond. Make sure to find out more about them on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web, whatever they are, to keep up to date with all their broadcasts throughout the week. And I hope you enjoy them as much as we do over here. Hello? Is anybody there? And welcome back. Um, now, we're talking with Norman Fay um, in regards to saying circles and other ancient monuments all over the place. Um, Kerry, is there any questions from the chat room? I think we're blowing their minds a little. Everyone's just like, they're happy to listen to this amazing person. 
I mean, we have had one, but it's to do more with um, at external UK, which is go Beckley Tepe. Don't know no. that. I don't know. I haven't no. really. I don't know about that as well. And another comment was there is um, a small, not on a grand scale, but there is a small stone circle at the village of Alphamstone in Essex. It might may not be a stone circle as such. It could probably be a, t- a tomb. It could be what we call a cr- cromlech. Oh, okay. Yeah, there, there is a there is a site called uh, Kit Kit Cote's house in Kent. I'm not, I'm not saying not saying that there's not. There are no megalithic sites down in Kent or, you know, the south of England, that, you know, south east of England. But most of them are not actually categorised as a stone circle, strictly speaking. That's all I'm saying. OK. They may, they may be misunderstood as to what the, what the, you know, it depends on how recent the research is. I would love to know if there is a stone circle. I have heard of that, actually, but I, I regard it as a tomb, like a okay. crop what, what we call a cromlech. Okay, so can I just clarify a point for myself, if that's yep. okay with you? Yep. Um, a henge is an earthwork where stones are within that, and a circle is just open. Did I get that right? Yeah, the henge is just an earthwork, technically speaking, is is just a, an earthwork with a with a ditch on the inside rather than the outside, and it can have more than one or two entrances, mo- mostly two entrances but at Avebury there are four there are four are they at the four compass points uh no they don't actually line up to the compass at all okay yeah I don't know I don't know the 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 actual roads might be later later added later to it so I don't know Um, okay never thought about that okay anyway carry on that was just right. a clarification for me, really. <laughs> right. Okay, so we're rambling through nearly twelve thousand years of history. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like I'd like to take you to one of the other sites which I've spent an awful long time studying, and it's on the Isle of Anglesey, uh, which is North Wales, and it's there, <laughs> there's a railway station uh, near the Britannia Bridge, and it's the longest. It's the longest place name in the world. Clangther, Gilly, 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 whatever it is. And it's very near to that. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just, just for your geography. And it's a place called uh, Brinkethley V. And it's, um, it's a, a fascinating place. And in the late 80s, I had a series of dreams and they, they nearly drove me mad. They were every night I had these dreams. And then I opened a book up. Well, I borrowed from the library about stone stone structures and you know prehistoric stuff. And there it was. I couldn't believe it. I nearly dropped the book. I thought I've got to go, and I did. I booked a holiday, stayed in Carnarvon, and I went out to bring Kethley. And the more I did, the more, the deeper I got into it. And it turns out that it started life as a, if you imagine, right right in the middle, right in the middle of the forest was a clearing. And it's where the, all the animals you would collect. For some reason, they did just congregate. Brinkethley V is Welsh for the mound in the dark grove. It was archaeologically excavated thoroughly in the 30s, I believe. I think it was in the 30s, then revisited. And he discovered evidence of what would have been a totem pole in the middle of just an empty forest. And then they added to it. And then they added to it. And then they put posts up. Then they put stones up. And then they turned it into a burial mound. It's one of the most stunning places to go if you're ever in north wales go to Brinkethley. it's really worth going to and you go down in this little like little it's very very similar to new grange actually you go down this little shaft and you come to this like a funny little chamber right in the middle and i had i had images as i as i went in i could see piles of skulls stacked up either side of the entrance this is in broad daylight. 
the, the former actually gave me a lift there. He with, gave me a hand with all my dowsing stuff. And right in the middle is a standing stone, right in the middle. And on one of the, one of the big stones that actually form the, the chamber, it's got a single symbol, and that's a spiral. Yeah. Now, it's the spiral is almost universally uh, represents the flow of water or focus of water or focus of energy, and there it is. It's the only thing in there, art-wise. They, when they excavated it, they found a stone. Over the, okay, they took the totem pole out, put human remains into it, and then covered it over with a stone covered in, covered in patterns, which is actually in the Museum of Wales in Cardiff. You can go, mm-hmm. But there's a, there's a replica of it standing outside of the, the monument, if you want to have a look at it. And they found one piece of human remain, and it was an ear bone. You know, if you look inside the human ear, there are, I think there are three, bone, three bones that actually form the, the use of your, your hearing. And it, you've got the, the anvil, the axe, and something else. It was one of those. How on earth they found that, I have no idea. The ancients were trying to tell us something about, you need to listen. That's what they were trying to tell us. But the pattern stone is an amazing piece of work. It's covered in these spirals and squiggles and like snake-like things. And it goes all over the all over the stone. And they covered it all over. So the average person that would visit it would never see that. But the people that ran it, they all knew it. And it, the other interesting fact about Brinketley is it was the last place that the Druids stood, stood up against the Romans. The Romans massacred the, the Druids at Brinketley. It's historic fact. Mm-hmm. That was it. They ended the whole of the Druidic um, caste, if you like. You know, the hierarchy. They got rid of them. Just went and just destroyed them. Was that like the last stand for Druidism? Yes, it was. It would. Yeah, they obviously thought. And so, the 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 the, the, the mound in the dark grove gives a little bit of an indication to the Druidic side of it because it's the it's the sacred grove that the Druids would actually pick the, the mistletoe from. Okay. Oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm, looking at, I'm actually looking at images of this. I've actually shared the links to the sites you're talking about, as I can find them, um, onto the chat room. So, guys, if you want to have a look at them while we're talking about them, don't forget to right-click, um, and you'll see the stone that Norman is talking about. And it is fascinating. The whole subject is incredible. Well, to me, is incredibly fascinating. Um, it, it, it's just extraordinary. There's some been some very very good recent research at that site, and they've. Uh, I did this when I I visited. Actually, I I recorded a lot of this stuff. Um, I discovered that there were stones, natural outcrops of stone, very very close by that had carvings on them, and everybody had missed that. And I reported it. Never got never got nothing back. I even I've in, I've even written to the site director about it. So well, I knew about that fifteen years ago. Yeah. No more. No, twenty five years ago. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sorry. I don't want to rub your nose in it, but I knew about this, and I can re- I can prove it. I can prove it. Do you so know? Do you know what the origin of those carvings were? The the, the what they known as is cup and ring mark stones, and they. The the reverse, you know, the old, the song, the Yorkshire song, Ilkley Moor Bar Tat. Ilkley Moor no. Bar Tat? No, no, no. no. <laughs> I've never heard of that. It's it's a, it's it's a, like a local folk folk song from from North Yorkshire. Ilkley Moor is where a lot of the factory workers and that. You, it was one of the nearest places they could actually go out and walk in the countryside. And Ilkley Moor, don't go in, don't go on Ilkley Moor without a hat. That's what that means, Ilkley Moor Bar Tap. Yorkshire. Um, there are, what, what it is famous for is the swastika, swastika, swastika stone. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's what's called a, a cup and ring mark stone. And 
it's been lots and lots of work on the there's loads in Scotland, loads in like the northeast of England and nowhere else. But that down in Anglesey, there's they've got one, uh, or we've got several actually, and they reckon that they depict tribal areas. You know, they might meet once a year and say, That's mine, that's mine, that's yours, that's yours. The conjecture got no idea really but that's what that's what the the thoughts are you know prehistoric carvings are a total mystery to us we can't possibly unpick what they mean you know they, they've they got their own belief systems and everything else you don't different language altogether yeah. but they seem to be they seem to transmit it from you know quite a wide area hmm. the and if you go into if you go into Brittany, uh, there's this amazing site called uh, called Karnak, and it's um, it's a stone circle, but it's an an, like an, an egg shaped thing. But running from it are about twenty avenues of stones that run for half a mile, not dead straight, but you know parallel. And there's, there's a guy called Ale, Ale, Alexander Tom. He was a mathematician uh, surveyor in the 60s, and he he surveyed it for the yeah. first time. Yeah. And he came up with he came up with the statistical proof that these prehistoric people had got mathematical knowledge, without a shadow of a doubt, that they could construct stuff that was before Pythagoras. They knew all about it. Where did they get that out from? Interesting. Where did the, yeah, where did the Egyptians get it from? I look looking through your website earlier. I did actually notice that one of the tabs in your menu was time travel. Yeah. Do you <laughs> do you think that has got anything to do with it? Um, I'm a firm believer in time travel. I've experienced it myself. So I've I've experienced what I used to class as a premonition but other people said it could have been a time slip time um, slip yeah or yeah. A, a sort of fracture in time that I could see something that happened or was going to happen minutes into the future and yeah. I've experienced that myself but I mean I, we was having this conversation with someone the other night both me and Kerry and um, we said well could you travel forward in time or is it not time travel then and is it classed as uh, parallel jumping parallel universe jumping that was it right okay you got me on a really a really big subject on this one but of course <laughs> no, I, lo- I love time travel to be fair and I know you do <laughs> it, it, well the, the, there is a, there is a the, the, there's a picture on my website on the, the time travel thing it's it's a. I think it includes a, an image of um, uh, Concord on it. I think it's uh, something that I did, an artwork I did in yeah. the nineties. And I've I call them time slides uh, to be different. Uh, I've experienced them several times, and the first time it happened to me, it was quite unnerving. The first time I ever had it was when I was a, a youngster. I'd be about seven or eight, I think. Mm. And I experienced it in my own, in the the family home, and I didn't well, know I didn't know what on earth was going on, and I didn't know what to tell my parents. Yeah. I thought, you know, really didn't know what it was. It wasn't until I got older that it, it happened several times. And for the for the listeners that don't know that I I I was the custodian at Castle Rising Castle in Norfolk for ten years. And I'm my wife. <laughs> whenever we bought, bought a property, she'd always, or about to buy a property, she always used to stick me through the door first to see if I came out looking like, <laughs> like <laughs> Go- <laughs> looking like Gollum. Uh, and she just if I came out, it was like the litmus test. If I thought, no, no chance, no chance. And when I got the job at the castle, she said, I'll give you six months before you start seeing stuff. And uh, she was about right, actually. It wasn't too far off. And I, 
I opened opened the property up, and I got a routine. And you open certain doors, and then you climb steps, and you go into one room, then the next room, up another flight of steps, and then I turned the I turned the the corner, and there's a guy standing in the chapel. There's a private chapel inside the castle. Okay. Now, I didn't know what to say about this because I knew the place was locked as locked up tight as anything from the night before. And I said, how the hell did you get in? And he said, uh, and he didn't know, he didn't say anything. He, he was a, a shortish bloke, but he got medieval clothes on. I said, I thought it was an, a reenactor, you know, medieval yeah. reenactor. He, he got a little book in his hand. He'd got a red, like a dark red coat, black hose, pointy shoes, and a black beret. And he had a little kind of thin, wispy beard. And he looked at me, and he saw me. He saw me. So I ran after him, and he just, he just moved to one side. And you cannot get out of that. There's only one way in, one way out. And I basically just got there. I thought, what the, what the heck's that? I would go back. But it was a real, as you or I, the light, the light was correct on him, you know. He saw me. So yeah. what on earth must he have thought in his own time? If, it was, if he was truly from the 14th century, which I think he could have well have been. Maybe he saw and a about, ghost. He, ghosts tend to be... Like, you know, your traditional kind of transparent type thing. Yeah. You know. Uh, um, <laughs> I've sorry. never met a ghost that ever's done that so far. Uh, me, <laughs> me neither. Me neither. But you know, we diverge. <laughs> but, you know, get, getting onto the... Back onto the stone circle type stuff. Um, we have got an awful lot more to learn about the subject... I wish there were an awful lot more people interested in Earth mysteries. That you know, it was very, very prevalent in the seventies and the eighties, and then it just suddenly fell, just like died a death. Yeah. And there why are tons. Why do you think that? Why do you think that the Earth mysteries died a death? And it. Do you think there was that jump into we want to see a ghost? So Earth mysteries sort of took a back step. Why? Why do you think that happened? I don't know because the, I mean I I attended quite a, what we used to call moots in those days, uh, conferences where you get a collection of speakers, you know, and do a, a couple of field trips out in the daytime, or whatever. And it, it was actually quite a community. There, there was one magazine which kind of linchpinned it the whole lot, and it was called the Lay Hunter. Uh, it, it was a magazine that started as a real scrappy little two two sheet thing in the sixties, and ended up as being a, a like a twenty page A four really glossy piece of work, edited by a bloke called uh, Paul. I met him several times, uh, and you know he was a great speaker. Still about now. What was the lay hunter all about? Now, it brings me back to the stone circles thing, and we did touch on alignments. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a phrase or a term, lay, lay line. Yeah. Which is banded around willy nilly, and most people don't know what a lay line is. A lay line is alignment from one thing to another with several things that actually connect with it. And the term was actually coined by a man called Alfred Watkins. Um, Alfred Watkins was a very interesting guy in Herefordshire um, in the early 20th century. And he his family basically supplied... Um, he, used to, he used to visit farms, he used to buy grain for the family family business, and he used to ride on a horse in the Breadwarden Hills. And he was riding up in the Breadwarden Hills one afternoon, and he stopped to light his pipe, have a little bit of a smoke, and he just happened to know, because he was on a horse, he could actually see over the hedge, and he noticed there was a stone, stone standing stone in the field. 
and he couldn't help noticing that it actually aligned with that church, with that burial mound, with that ancient tree, and he got home and he drew his first physical dr- ley line. He, ter- he, t- he coined the phrase, lay- the term ley line. Yeah. And I've got a first edition of the, the ancient trackways, ancient British trackways. I've got a first edition. It's worth a fortune. Oh, I'm going to know where I'm going to be robbing this weekend. <laughs> but you, <laughs> but, but you, can, you can actually buy, you can buy a current edition off um, Abacus, which is called the Old Straight Track. Now, anybody that's interested in this kind of subject, the, the Old Straight Track is, a, if you like, a beefed-up version of the ancient British trackways. Uh, it, it, I think it's still currently available. You can certainly get it off Amazon. But um, what he did, he started a whole revolution of ideas, and they formed the Old Straight Track Club, where people would go out on a Sunday Sunday afternoon with a you know with a picnic and everything else. And around Herefordshire, started off in Herefordshire and then it spread. By the sixties, the idea had been picked up by the UFO people. <laughs> And they started to think, ah, right, these these ley lines are something to do with the way that UFOs hop from one place to the other. They're like guidance, a guidance system. And then I'd love to know who actually started the idea that ley lines were energy energy lines. I can't quite find out who exactly started to do it. It could be a guy called Paul Screeton. I wouldn't want to cast aspersions on him. But then it was picked up, and then it just generally became known as an energy line. Not a physical alignment from where you could actually walk from one place to the other in a straight line. The the most puzzling thing about ley lines is, unfortunately, that falls apart because they go across valleys where you come to like a, a sheer drop. And then there's nothing, and then you pick it up again on the other side of the valley. The, the, that's my, that's the only thing that I can't really. Would it find. would it not be like a natural progression, if if you're assuming that the stone circles in particular are placed on places where there's running water, if you're now lining them up, would it just not be a, um, would it not just be connected to that like natural progression? going from there to site A to site B and then just drawing a line to through to site C sort of thing. And because all those are all on the water for the energy, it's mm-hmm. sort of a natural progression to think that they might be the energy lines, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I, under, I understand. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, I agree. There, there, are, there are one or two really good um, or below famously has got about it's got about 15 ley lines run through it from and i've i've checked them out mm. I've, I've actually physically been out in the countryside and done it and walked walked them yeah and pr- proved it taken photographs of that the, the best one of the lot is um if you go back to stonehenge if you stand in stonehenge and you look i think you have to look north to salisbury Right. Salisbury, Salisbury Cathedral, which goes on northwards to Old Sarum. Now, Old Sarum is an Iron Age fort, and that's where the original cathedral was built, up on the top of the hill. There, there's a book by Ken Follett called The Pillars of the Earth, mm. if anybody wants to. It's well worth a read. Uh, it's, it's a fiction, in and they made a TV uh, series out of it. I, I was not very impressed with the TV series, but the book itself is just terrific. Yeah, and it's and it's about the building of Old Sarum Church, uh, you know, in the twelfth century. But there is a direct, absolutely arrow straight line that runs from Stonehenge, South Salisbury, Salisbury Cathedral, up to Old Sarum Church, and you you can't shake it. It's it's there. They've, I've yeah. tried to do it on Google Maps and everything. You can't shake it. There's something going on. And that's probably the reason why they've placed Salisbury Cathedral, the one that you see today from the 13th, 12th and 13th century, where it is. And it's in the wrong place because it's in the floodplain. 
Yeah. They've got a major problem down in Salisbury Cathedral because they've got flooding underneath the foundations. They have to pump it out every day. Yeah, wrong place. Might have thought a good idea at the time. It's because there was nothing there. Yeah. <laughs> or so they thought. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, Who knows? possibly. Hmm. That's interesting. Something interesting. Have you got any more questions? So many. <laughs> we'll be here all night. <laughs> we'll be here all night. <laughs> not not about not about stone circles, but time travel maybe. But we'll, we'll do that later, I think. <laughs> oh my goodness! So much food for thought there. There's so much information that you've shared tonight, and so interesting on a personal level for me because obviously I work in the way that you're talking, and I'm realizing. I'm so at the beginning of that journey. <laughs> what I would like to say, and this is this is what there's something that's often levelled at me, is because they try they try to pigeonhole me, guys. Um, I do not claim to be a psychic, medium, or clairvoyant, but I do use. Um, I've got a special table, which was built for me, bespoke, uh, to order. <clears throat> The design of which is actually you can get it off my website if you want to build one. Um, it's on the it's on the well it's called it's called the seance table obviously, but it I, it was it was delivered to me as a piece of information. Um, I ran a I ran an evening event and I I used to use a, I used to use a kitchen table a little kitchen table to do table work. Mm. A lot of people don't like to do that, but I did. And uh, I, but it used to give me a terrible backache. And this guy turned up with. He says, "I've got a table in the back of the car. Shall we try it?" And it looked like a plant stand. It, you know, it kind of is up to waist height, octagonal, hexagonal. And we tried it out. And it nearly flew out the door. I couldn't believe it. And I said, where did you get this from? He says, oh, I got a guy from Lincolnshire designed it. He got it through Spirit World. And he got to have it exactly those measurements. If you don't, it won't work. And I thought, right, okay. Then, so I contacted him a few weeks later. I said, any chance I get those measurements? He, he kind of hung back and he, did, he eventually managed to winkle them out of him. Eventually, I had to go around and virtually threaten him with violence before he gave it to <laughs> me, but... Um, I did get them, and they are they are actually on the, the the website. Mine was built by a cabinet maker. I mean, a top a top notch cabinet maker. It's made of oak, and it's a fantastic piece of work. I've not used it for over a year. It's, it, it, people often ask, well, "What do you do when you're not what What do you do with it when you're not using it?" So you cover it up with a cloth, like a like a budgery budgery gar. You know, just shut it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but when it goes, and I've got a very, very set way of using it, and it, and certainly it is dead serious, this is, I spend three days preparing for it. I do, a, I do an opening ritual, do the communication, close it down properly, and then I spend, I spend three days or more actually leading out from it. So it's not just at that moment. It yeah. can take up to it takes about a week to actually get anything that is safe because it, the, you're talking. I'm not talking a Ouija board. I'm talking about this is hardcore communication, spirit communication. Um, I've never never been tempted to go and take it onto a prehistoric site. Um, I've thought about it and I've decided against it. Yeah, but it. it, it, it it, she, him, him, whatever it is, is still covered up in a, in a very, very heavy cloth, and I've not used it for a year, so, but it's there, it's there, and it kind of sits, just kind of waiting for the next go. But the responses I've had from people that have actually built them, because I know several people have actually built them, and they don't work. Yeah. Why is that? Why don't is it is it because it's something I've I'm doing right or I've tried to explain how to do it and even then it's well we don't get anything out of it doesn't work I'm not I'm not claiming to be anything special mm-hmm. 
I just put the I put the work I put the work in, the effort in, and I do believe that an awful lot of people out there are not prepared to go the full mile. No, I agree with that. I agree. We do have a couple of questions in the chat room. Go on then. At this point. Firstly, has have you ever visited the Priscelli Hills in Pembrokeshire where the stones for Stonehenge were quarried? Stones. No, never been never been physically. No. But um I'm, I'm aware of where they are. Uh, is this person from Wales? No, it's just got an interest. Yeah, it's it it's ge- been, they've proved it geologically that these stones have definitely been quarried, uh, yeah. and I, I think it's about a hundred miles or something like that. It's, stu- it's a stupid amount of. They, yes, they could have actually sailed the stones a certain amount. You know, the way that you move stone in the old days was by boat. And if you've got a, a reasonable river to go on to, you drag it onto the river, take it down to the estuary, onto the main river, follow the coast round and find the next river as near as you can, because Stonehenge is actually quite close to a river. The, these people were not stupid, and that's that's just, what we have to do is bury the idea that, that the prehistoric people were stupid. No, they weren't. They were very, very intelligent. Mm-hmm. more intelligent than all the pop- lot of people around today I'm afraid yeah, you know. I agree with that point um, and yeah. another thing was does Norman agree with the theory that there was a standard unit of measurement used in building these structures the megalithic yard yes yeah that was um, uh, I think that was Alexander Tom I did, I did actually touch on Alexander Tom um, his, his work on the uh, what they call we call met, metrology. Um, I think he pre, it was predated by that because there's one or two they got people like Lockyer uh, and there were a couple of them, other people that kind of, they all came to the same idea. And by mm-hmm. the six by the sixties and the seventies, at the time when I'm talking about Earth mystery stuff, um, the megalithic yard was like a standard uh, agreed thing. Yeah, because they all. They did seem to con- conform statistically that, yeah, these pe- somebody must have gone round with a piece of stick and said, you can borrow that if you want and you can copy that. And that's, how, that's why they're so uniform from one site to the next. That's, mm. that, you know, that's probably the only, the only explanation for it because they can't – as a random thing, you, well, the Egyptians had the cubit. And the cubit was measured from your elbow to the tip of your finger, your middle finger. <clears throat> Hang on a minute, depends who you are. <laughs> <laughs> but the cubit became the standard measurement in ancient Egyptian building. Um, we used the cubit up to quite, quite recently in history. Yeah, it was, became a standard measurement. We didn't use the megalithic yard, but we used the cubit. Mm. Mm. That was a good question. That was I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Paul. Okay, so we have come to the end of the show tonight. Sadly, it's been amazing. Actually, I'm, I'm just sort of blown away by some of that information. It's been good. So Honestly, I wanna... the notes I've got is just astonishing. And you've got <laughs> we, we've got plenty of reading to catch up on. Oh, we it's certainly good. do. You're too kind. All um, all I say as a closing thing is that you need to have the enthusiasm. Absolutely. And I've certainly got a passion for it. And I know Kerry has. Um, Oh, gosh, yeah. This is right up my alley. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Well, if you you want to contact me directly, you can do. Um, You know, if if people want to email me, they can do. Um, uh, I'm, I'm on Facebook. If you want to keep track of what I'm doing on Facebook... You know, very prolific on that. You know, if folks want to sort of just say, um, listen to the show or or come via your site, um, I'm more than happy to ask, you know, answer questions if they're interested. It, Fantastic. It, I just, I just want to, I want to shake the tree a little bit because I'm, I think the record has stuck a little bit at the moment, mm-hmm. and I, I want to get on with doing something new. Yeah. You know, no, we've said this before, and um, we've said it feels very stagnant at the moment, 
and we need to push that forward and work conjunction with science and the old methods and you know all different methods need to come together to push the field forward we've said this several times haven't we paul yeah we have absolutely um, i'm pleased to hear and we're, we're doing our bit we're trying yeah. to <laughs> we're pushing forward absolutely yeah um but absolutely norman we'd have to have you again on the show at some point uh, maybe we can tackle time travel <laughs> are you are you are you sure about that? <laughs> Absolutely, I'll be well up for that. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a good show. I think Kerry will probably not be part of that. Maybe. <laughs> oh no, I'm I'm all over that. I have theories oh, of my own on that particular awesome. subject. Right. <laughs> well, that, you, you're, you're straying into the past life. Regress inside the thing. Exactly. Well. We'll, we'll <laughs> a, I've, had, I've had that one done, and you wouldn't believe what, what came out of that one. We'll, we'll have a four hour show on that one, I think. <laughs> but anyway, yes, oh thank, my goodness. Thank you, great Norman. To you. Yep, thank you for joining us. And yep. thank you, Kerry, as well, for joining me, as always. Always welcome. Yeah. Always and welcome. I want to thank everyone that's been in the chat room tonight. It's been brilliant, and hopefully, you've enjoyed it. And Next week, I believe I'm talking to Andy Mercer about um, the opposite of witchcraft. So oh. that that should be quite interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. So thank you, everybody, and see you all again next week. Mm-hmm.